Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, so that there may come times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. Acts 3.19 Lord Jesus, we are grateful for the cleansing of our past sins and the new life you offer us. Give us the strength and courage to turn away from our past and embrace the future you have prepared for us. Help us to live in the freedom of your forgiveness, leaving behind old habits and walking boldly in your light. May our hearts remain steadfast in following you, trusting in your guidance and embracing the refreshing renewal you bring. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you for praying with me today. You're listening to The Jesus Podcast, dramatic stories inspired by the Bible. Remain here for another story from our mini-series on the birth of the church. Has this podcast inspired you? We would love it if you'd left a rating and review and shared with a friend. Despite the buzzing of worshipers passing through the temple gates, Ira paid Peter and John his full attention. These men had changed his life in an instant and hadn't asked anything in return. Ira was sure he had never met them and had no wealth or power for them to abuse. He couldn't piece together the reason for them showing him the greatest act of kindness he had ever known. But if they were really empowered men of God, as Ira believed them to be, maybe that was all the motivation they needed to help a poor beggar like himself. Please allow me to come with you to the temple to worship. The name of the Lord must be glorified for his goodness. We would be happy to have you. Our friends should be just inside the walls. Gather your belongings and we'll head in together. Ira fumbled for his possessions, though he knew none of them were necessary anymore. Those had been the tools of a man who had lost any hope of leading a normal life, the means necessary to simply scrape by for survival. But his homely mat and blemished bowl were now the mere reminders of a past that Ira was quickly leaving behind with radical speed, only made possible by the unstoppable force of the Spirit of God. But even his numerous years of making the most of his situation couldn't have prepared him for the miracle he experienced that day. He had no plans for the future, nor ever intended to. Allowing himself to daydream in such a way had become more depressing than anything else. For all of his hope in God, he never allowed himself the privilege of imagining the immense freedom he now had. While others took the simple act of walking for granted, to Ira, walking opened the grand expanse of the world to be explored at his own will. He haphazardly rolled up his cushion and balled it into his mat. He stared at the bundle. His old life sat before him with the same stillness that once bound him. He clapped his hands together. I suppose that's it. Shall we go in? Miracles are opportunities. When God opens people's eyes and grabs their attention, we have to be swift to seize the moment. Welcome to The Jesus Podcast. I'm Zach, your host from Pray.com, here to dive into another story inspired by the book of Acts. If you've been enjoying this podcast, you know what to do. Make sure to follow on whatever platform you listen, and it would be awesome if you rated us and left a review as well. Today, we're stepping into the sandals of Peter as he delivers another show-stopping sermon. This episode is inspired by Acts 3, 10-26, and let me tell you, Peter knows how to captivate a crowd. Fresh off the miraculous healing of a lame man at the gate beautiful, Peter doesn't miss a beat. He uses the opportunity to preach the gospel. The man is clinging to Peter and John, probably out of sheer gratitude, amazement, and maybe a mixture of, wow, that just happened, and please don't leave me. The crowd is buzzing, jaws are dropping, and what does Peter do? He seizes the moment for a sermon. Because why not? The trio strode into the temple courts. 
Ira's eyes darted all around, keenly taking in the sights as though it was for the first time. He found the thought a little silly, but the few feet and the difference he observed the world with now gave a new perspective on everything around him. Seas of people that used to roll over him like waves were suddenly gentle tides to casually wade through. Stairs seemed like anthills compared to the mountainous terrain they once were. Whatever power had given strength to his legs had not only changed his physical abilities, but was changing his entire outlook on life. As they walked through the courtyard, puzzled stares were visible all around. Several men and women pointed in Iris' direction, frantically whispering to one another. It was a new experience for the once lame beggar, who had become accustomed to others simply ignoring him after he had sunken into the margins of society. But Peter and John were all too familiar with the notoriety stirred up after a miracle had been performed. A few of those who had been startled to see Ira's sudden regaining of faculties approached the three men. Aren't you the bigger from the gates? The one who's been here for years? I know it's him. I live just down the road and I see him every day when I pass the Temple Mount. How did this happen? Tell us, what is your secret? Was it these men here? Sirs, did you heal the lame beggar? Ira gave a polite but awkward wave as more curious onlookers came to investigate. He hadn't considered how others would react to his miraculous healing. If he had been honest with himself, he had assumed most wouldn't care, let alone notice. He wondered if the newfound strength in his legs was worth being the center of attention. For him, attention had never meant anything but trouble. But Peter and John knew the people weren't coming to make a mockery of Ira or cause him any harm. They were coming in wonder and awe at what they were witnessing. Peter tilted his head toward Ira. Just stay calm and follow our lead. We've done this before. Ira took a step behind the apostles and subconsciously gripped their garments with his fingertips to feel some sense of security. Peter looked at John to see if he was thinking the same thing. John gestured forward and bowed his head, giving Peter the cue to step up to the plate. Fellow Israelites, why are you so surprised at what you see here today? You stare at us as though it was our own power or godliness that allowed us to make this man walk. But it was not for our sake that this man was healed. No! The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus through this sign. This same Jesus was the man you handed over to be killed. You disowned him from his own people before Pilate, even when the governor had decided in his own heart to let him go. Peter could tell that his words were cutting his audience to the heart. Just as he had seen the people's response to the accusation of murdering Jesus on Pentecost, he knew that the bad news would soon make way for the good news of Jesus' gospel. But even worse, you disown the Holy and Righteous One and ask that a murderer be released to you to join your ranks. By your own hands, you killed the author of life. But... As the author of life, even the grave could not hold him, for God raised him from the dead. And we stand here today as witnesses of this, for your sake. Ira's fist clenched tighter at the tunics of the apostles. He was worried that his miracle worker was only making matters worse by accusing the people of putting Jesus to death. Peter, on the other hand, had been consumed with a peace beyond his understanding. Peter could feel Ira's grip on the side of his clothes. He placed his hand on Ira's, hoping that he could extend an ounce of peace to his new acquaintance. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him as you can all see. So this man was healed by this Jesus, yet you say we killed him. I can't speak for the crowds here, but I've never so much as struck my neighbor. Please, take no offense at my words. I know that you all acted in ignorance, 
just as the leaders of our people did. But we now know that it was God who allowed it, so that he could fulfill all that he had foretold through the prophets that his Messiah would suffer for the sake of the people. Ira was stunned that the man made no rebuttal against the apostle's statement. In fact, nobody did. It was as though they had been enlightened and accepted Peter's accusation as true. Ira's suspicions were quickly confirmed. Surely there must be something we can do to make it right. I would never intentionally dishonor the Lord our God. Is there nothing we can do to earn his forgiveness? Out of the corner of his eye, Peter could see John beaming a smile. It was the moment both of them had been waiting for. Like clockwork, the gospel message of their master had broken the people's hearts wide open, and the Spirit was now planting seeds in the freshly cultivated soil. For all of their sowing and watering, it was God who gave the increase. Repent of your sins. Turn to God and receive His forgiveness. Through the blood of Jesus, He will wipe out your sins. Be of good cheer, brothers and sisters, for in due time the Lord will send the Messiah, Jesus Christ, to you. And in that time you will experience times of refreshing from Him. But as for now, heaven must receive Him until the time comes for God to restore everything, just as He promised long ago through His holy prophets. The crowd was dead silent, holding their collective breath determined to not miss a word of the bold preacher standing before them. Peter felt like he was watching the scene from outside his own body. As a boy, he had memorized the stories of Israel's greats, like Abraham, Jacob, Moses, and David. To picture himself, a measly fisherman, one day moving crowds to repent, was beyond his wildest dreams. But for all of his aspirations, it was Jesus who had brought him thus far, and it was Jesus who would sustain him. So long as it was the Lord's name he lifted high before the people, Peter was confident God would continue to use him. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, Beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, Through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. Peter's call to repentance had worked. Dozens of men and women who filled the courtyards had fallen to their knees in deep conviction. They shuffled towards the feet of the apostles. They had been inspired by Ira's miraculous healing, but it was only the transformative power of the gospel that had allured their hearts to a saving faith in the Lord Jesus. Peter and John did their best to control the crowds while keeping an eye on Ira, who was still dumbfounded at the unexpected gathering. The apostles spent the next few hours answering the people's questions. They told them about the multitudes of other believers gathering regularly throughout Jerusalem, that they could now join on this new road of following the ways of Jesus. The dimming sunlight alerted the people of nightfall's swift approach, but nobody dared to depart from the gathering. What they were learning was of greater importance than a timely arrival to their homes. A woman was pressing through the streams of people in the opposite direction, She was doubled over and scanning the ground, calling out as she made her way through the courtyard. Ira? Ira? Where have they taken him? Oh, I knew I had a bad feeling about today. I should have never left him alone. Ira's head perked up at the sound. He spun his head around like an owl as he laughed back in response. Tetsa, is that you? I'm over here. Ira stretched his body as tall as he could and waved his arms sporadically over his head. His face broke out in a wide grin at this accomplishment. Terza's face contorted in disbelief at the sight. She gasped in seeing her beloved friend, not only well, but standing on his own two feet. 
She had hoped to find Ira in good health, but never expected to find him like this. What? How? You can thank my new friends here for that. Or rather, you can thank their friend, Jesus. But please, allow me to introduce you, Peter and John. With a wave of his hand, the two men stepped around Ira. Terza could find no words. For years, she had painstakingly carried Ira to the temple gates out of a devotion to care for her friend. If these men had truly healed Ira, she considered them to be friends of hers now, too. She scanned Peter and John up and down. From her observations, there was nothing remarkable or any apparent standout qualities about them. But through some force, she had yet to discover they had indeed healed Ira. His cheery bouncing beside the apostles made that unassailable. Peter and John could read Terza's astonishment like an open book. They had seen the same look many times before at Jesus' miracles, and now they would follow in his footsteps. Shalom. It appears we are connected through our newly upright friend here. My name is Peter. This is John. We are followers of Jesus. It was through faith and by his name that Ira now stands. But I believe we've caused enough of a commotion for you both today. Please, go and rest and sin no more. <laughs> Terza gave a sudden and vibrant laugh. You want us to just go? After all of this? Absolutely. You both have a lot of life to catch up on. Plus... The people here still have need for us. If you ever need anything, please let us know. We are forever in your debt. Well, you are in debt to no one. Now go in the freedom of Jesus Christ. She smiled affectionately at Peter, then turned to Ira with tears forming in her eyes. She was still trying to reconcile this new reality in her mind. Ira clicked his heels and promptly bent over to secure his mat to his back. He gestured to the group and bound off out of the temple courts. Terza hesitated. This was the first time in ages she would be leaving the temple without a stretcher over her shoulder. She took a step forward, then another. There was an unfamiliar air of lightness to her steps, as though God himself had lifted her weariness and propelled her forward. The walk back to her house was therapeutic. Like Ira, viewing life free of her previous burdens had given her a whole new perspective of the city. No longer did she avoid the more unkempt roads or laborious hills of the city. In fact, both she and Ira gladly welcomed them, exercising the extent of their strength without the burdens of their former life. The Spirit of Jesus Christ was sweeping through Jerusalem like wildfire, leaving nothing in His path unchanged. But this change wasn't solely related to circumstances or situations. He was breaking chains, renewing minds, and transforming hearts to the praise of God's glorious grace. Peter starts off by asking a simple question. Why do you marvel at this? Or why do you look so intently at us as though our own power or godliness has made this man walk? Now, I love this because Peter is essentially saying, why are you looking at us as if we're some kind of spiritual superheroes? Why are you staring at us as if it was our power that made this man well? Peter is quick to redirect the crowd's focus from himself and John back to Jesus. And my friends, this is so crucial for our faith as well. When people praise us for our kindness or for our gentleness or for some act of charity that we perform for somebody else, we have to always and faithfully redirect people's attention to the source of that good work, Jesus. Peter knows a few things that many of us tend to forget. First of all, it's not about you at all. It's about Jesus and Jesus alone. Second, miracles, as amazing as they are, are not the main event in and of themselves. They're not the finish line. They're actually the starting gun. 
Miracles grab people's attention, but it's the message of the gospel that saves souls. Peter could have easily basked in the glow of this miraculous moment. He would sign a book deal, launch his new podcast and the series called Miracle Workers, and then take them to show on the road. Instead, he turns the crowd's amazement into an opportunity to preach about Jesus. Always be wary of people who gain popularity and notoriety for their miracles and build a brand centered around them. Peter and John's response to people's praise tells us something about Jesus' will and intention for when we perform miracles. When something amazing happens through us, we must redirect people's attention to the one who actually accomplished this work, the Holy Spirit. Peter goes on to remind them that this wasn't some random act of power either. It was the work of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's speaking these Jews' language, connecting Jesus to the very foundations of their faith. And then Peter goes for the jugular. He makes this statement, You delivered up and denied the holy and just one, and you asked for the murder of God. Ouch. Peter isn't holding back here at all. He reminded them that they chose Barabbas, a criminal, over Jesus, the Prince of Life. He's saying that the one who performed this miracle and the one who restored this man It's the same one who wants to restore your souls, but by no means trick yourselves into thinking that you're in good standing with him. In fact, you were his enemy. You're the one who put him to death. This is actually a truth bomb that we all need to ingest ourselves, as hard as it might be. We were enemies of God until we chose to follow him. And there's no inherent identity that we're automatically in good standing with God. We need to call upon the name of Jesus. Peter is putting it out there. You got it wrong, guys. You got it wrong big time. But before you think Peter is just up there to shame them, understand that he's not interested in condemnation, but in conviction. He's saying, look in the mirror. You messed up, but there's still hope. Peter clarifies how the lame man was healed. He said that by Jesus' name and through faith in his name, this man was made strong. It wasn't Peter's charisma or John's piety. It was the powerful name of Jesus. In biblical terms, a name wasn't just a label. It represented the very essence and authority of a person. So when Peter says faith in his name, he's talking about a faith that taps into the very power, presence, and identity of Jesus himself. So let's pause for a second here. What are we putting our faith in today? Whose name are we living for? Is it our own? Is it a celebrity or a politician that we follow? Is it our good intentions, our hard work, or our reputation? Is it our well-thought-out plans, our careers, our bosses? Is it a brand that we follow? Friends, let me tell you, none of these things can make the lame walk or the blind see. We need to have faith squarely in the name of Jesus, because only he has the power to transform lives. Peter, after dropping this very heavy truth, doesn't leave them in despair, though. Instead, he gives them a path forward. He says, repent, therefore, and be converted, and your sins may be blotted out so that the times of refreshing may come in the presence of the Lord. Let's talk about repentance really quick, because a lot of people mistake repentance for apologizing. You see, apologizing is saying sorry and acknowledging you did something wrong. Repentance isn't just acknowledging you did something wrong or feeling sorry. It's a turnaround. It's like making a U-turn when you realize you're headed in the wrong direction. But here's the good news. Even though repentance is hard and changing our ways is hard and acknowledging the power of Jesus is hard, it leads to ultimate refreshment. Isn't that what we all need? In a world full of chaos, stress, and bad news, we need times of refreshing. And these times come from the presence of the Lord, not from Netflix binges, social media likes, or a perfect vacation. Peter reminds them of Moses' prophecy, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things. The crowd knew this prophecy well. They knew that Moses was speaking of an ultimate redeemer and messiah. Peter is making it clear Jesus is that prophet that Moses spoke of. And rejecting him isn't just a bad decision, it's a disastrous one for your soul. Peter says it plainly, every soul who will not hear the prophet shall be utterly destroyed. But he doesn't end with a threat. He points back to the promise given to Abraham. In your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Peter is saying this promise is for you, but it's also to anyone who will receive it of any nation. So here's the takeaway, friends. Don't just marvel at a simple miracle. Cling to the Messiah. The healed man at the gate beautiful wanted change, but he got transformation. 
The crowd wanted a spectacle, but they got a sermon. And you, you may come looking for a little inspiration today, but God wants to offer you so much more. He wants to offer you new life in Jesus. So repent, turn around, and let the times of refreshing come. Because when you put your faith in His name, Jesus' name, miracles don't just happen. They transform your outlook on life, and they transform who you are from the inside out. Thanks again for listening to the Jesus Podcast. Join us tomorrow for another breathtaking story inspired by the book of Acts, where we learn that Jesus moves and breathes in us and through us today.